Well, distillers grains is really being used a lot in our feedlot industry and there's been a huge increase, probably out of all the byproduct feeds uh, that we've ever had available for the feedlot industry. The use of distillers grains represents the greatest change in the feeding of our cattle, probably in the last 30, 40 years in terms of how we're feeding the diets. And uh, there's been a lot of work done on the nutritional value of, of distillers grains and how they can fit in the diet. And, and for the most part, that all looks pretty favorable in terms of their use. Uh, but there's been some work done in the United States that suggests that, that in putting distillers grains into corn-based diets, uh, corn distillers grains would result in an increase in the shedding of E. coli 157. And 0157 is, uh, we have good bacteria and we have bad bacteria in our, in our uh, environment and E. coli 157 is, is one of the bad ones. We have a lot of good E. coli, both in the cattle and in ourselves, but uh, 0157 doesn't cause any disease in the cattle, but it causes us a lot of trouble because it can cause bloody diarrhea and kidney failure and in some cases even death. So it's something we want to try to avoid. So there, there was some papers uh, published in the States that suggested that it increases E. coli 157. So really we wanted to explore whether that's the case in Canada. And the work that we did, because one of the big differences between the Canada and the United States is that we feed barley-based diets uh, instead of corn-based diets like they do in the U.S. So nobody really knew whether or not if that was an effect in Canada. Plus the other uh, thing we had to consider was that we also have wheat distillers grains and corn distillers grains, we have both of those sources. So what we did is we did a study where we compared uh, cattle consuming wheat distillers grains, cattle consuming corn distillers grains, and cattle consuming our normal barley based diet with no distillers grains. And in those studies basically we, we collected samples over a long period of time and we measured the amount of E. coli-157 we could find in their feces. And when we completed all of that work at the end of the day after about 500 or so samples, we came to the conclusion that there was no difference amongst those treatments in the, in the incidence of 0157. So that contrasts a bit with the U.S. Uh, data, maybe perhaps because we're feeding barley-based diets and they're feeding corn-based diets, and that may cause some difference in the digestive tract that influences the survival of 0157 or the persistence of 0157 within the digestive tract of cattle. So for the, that's really our overall findings. So it's a good news story for the Canadian feedlot industry. Well, I think mostly from the US data, there's a lot of theories as to why that may be, but there's not really any concrete evidence that would be, give you one defining factor. Some of it might be related to changes in pH and nutrient content within the digestive tract. Perhaps those changes result in conditions in the case of corn-based diets that are more favorable for 0157 when it's fed with distillers grains versus with barley. There, those, those particular conditions don't exist. pH has probably been the thing that's been studied the most. Uh, and typically the pH is lower in the digestive tract, the lower digestive tract where the E. coli survive on corn-based diets than it is on barley based diets because more starch gets to the lower tract for fermentation. So that could be one of the reasons but nobody really knows the answer to that question. And, and we're trying to like really in order to get down to know those reasons you have to have a more mechanistic approach and, and we're doing studies in that area to determine because we know that E. coli 157 will survive in some animals and not in others and at this point we don't know why that is either. So a lot of what we're doing is going down to the gene level and doing genomic characterization. So looking about what's difference uh, in the microbial populations and the genes that are present in cattle that carry 0157 versus those that don't. And if we can sort of define some of those differences, perhaps that'll shed some light into why that exists and why those differences are present. So what Our risks are kept to a very, very low level though because we have very strict conditions in place. The, the, the processing plants have invested literally millions of dollars in, in uh, mitigation strategies. Most of those mitigation strategies have been employed within the processing plants. Things like acid washes, uh, thermal treatment, there's a number of different things, vacuuming, all of those things that they do have been implemented to reduce the likelihood of contamination. There's few techniques that have been applied on the farm. There's been quite a bit of research, but that gets much more complicated when you move to a farm environment because there's many more variables than just the carcass coming into a slaughter plant. So things like reducing tag and all of those can help reduce the likelihood of risk. And our, our processors have already taken 
many of those steps already to try to mitigate it as much as possible. But the microbial world is very diverse and very difficult. There's no such thing as annihilating a bacteria. You know, you can lower its numbers, you can reduce the risk, but to get it to zero in all environments, that's not possible. This, this outbreak in, in Germany that's occurring right now, um, really they haven't found the source of that. They originally we talked about cucumbers, then they talked about bean sprouts. Now they're not even sure whether it might be just human to human transmission. So, you know, food preparation and handling is always a key part of preventing any kind of bacterial infection, you know, whether you're talking about how long that material is stored for or how well you cook it. You know, in terms of hamburger, the easiest thing is to just properly cook your hamburger. Because E. coli 157 is very sensitive to temperature. So temperatures of about 40 degrees Celsius, it'll start to die. By 55, it's all dead. Mm -hmm.